Yes, sir. Actually, the starting here because we the fifth and eighth graders one because the uh, Thanksgiving pop up. Yep, everything from there on at least. I was singing now, but it seems like it's but I know we're having trouble with this. Sarah, Sarah's trying to find out who the AI is on. A high sign about this one. I know that that's going to happen. Welcome to the 10th Sunday of this autumnal season. The moon is a waxing gibbous, gloriously full tomorrow. We are met together, and in meeting we are blessed. Peace in coming and in going, peace in labor and in rest. Hold on, dear one, hold on to me. Good morning. morning. Welcome to First Unitarian Church of Des Moines. I'm Louise Alcorn, she, her, and I'm a member of the Celebrant team. And I'm Bill Brock, he, his, also a member of the Celebrant team and with Louise, a member of the choir. Our church is located on land that has been home to various peoples in the last 12,000 years including at the beginning of European encroachment, the Iowa, Sauk, and Meskwaki peoples. This region was also home to the passenger pigeon, the last of whom passed from the earth in September 1914. As we enter this space, the ghosts of humans and other animals past are among us. Let us recommit to understanding the history of the land it occupies, and to owning our part in the work of education, reparation, and healing for all species. We are an intergenerational community bound not by creed or canon, but by covenant articulated in our bond of union. We associate ourselves together for the study and practice of morality and religion as interpreted by the growing thought and noblest lives of humanity hoping thereby to prove helpful one to another and to promote truth, righteousness, and love in the world. That bond is reiterated in this congregation's mission to grow ethically and spiritually, serve justly, and love radically. A special welcome to our visitors. If you are here with children, feel free to keep them seated with you or take advantage of our We Worship space in the back of the auditorium 
where you and your child may play with toys and books. We invite children in kindergarten through fourth grade to go to their classroom downstairs after the time for all ages. This week, the Congregational Life Committee is hosting a Thanksgiving potluck after the service in lieu of our regular Sunday forum. Most weeks, you can join us at 11 a.m. in Griffin Hall at the end of the corridor for topical speakers and presentations. Please silence your cell phones during the service. If you are joining us via Zoom, please make sure your mics are muted throughout the service. Please say with me our unison chalice lighting words in your program. We kindle this chalice to represent the joy of invitation and the warmth of belonging. We come together from many places and bear the imprint of all we've encountered. The light that draws us together best is the flame we light together. Our opening hymn is number 349, We Gather Together. Sarah Chong will lead us. Please rise as you are willing and able and join her. Our story today is One Smile by Cynthia McKinney. One breezy summer morning, Katie was walking through the park with her mother. Hurry up, sweetheart, her mother urged, or we'll be late for the bus. Oh, mommy, said the little girl, I sure hope our van is fixed in time for grandpa's birthday party. Just then, they noticed a sad young man sitting alone on a bench. Katie stopped for a moment and smiled brightly at him. The young man had lost his job and was feeling very discouraged. Dozens of people had walked by that morning, but no one seemed to notice him. Then this little girl appeared and touched his heart with the sweetest smile he'd ever seen. He suddenly felt inspired to start looking for a new job. As he hurried down the street, the man saw a woman struggling to change a tire. Let me help you with that, he offered, without hesitation. The woman had been driving to an important meeting when she heard a loud thump, 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 and pulled over to the side of the road. Many people had passed by before this helpful young man came to her rescue. Later, as she finished lunch, the woman was feeling grateful for the young man's help, so she left an extra large tip. Thanks, thanks a lot, the waitress called out. On her way home, the waitress decided to surprise her children. Using the extra tip money, she picked up sodas, potato salad, and fried chicken. Then she bought the soccer ball her children had been hoping for. Surprise, she called out. Let's go have a picnic. Wow, Mom, her youngest boy exclaimed. You're the best. Can we invite the girl next door? She's new in town and doesn't have any friends yet. Good idea, his mother said. Let's invite the whole family. The little girl had been sitting alone in her room, missing her grandparents and friends when the phone rang. She couldn't believe the boy next door was calling. Maybe we could be friends, she thought. The girl and her parents brought some homemade brownies, and they all enjoyed a very special evening together in the park. After she got ready for bed, the little girl couldn't wait to call her grandma back home on the farm. Guess what, Nana? We had a really fun picnic with our neighbors. 
I think I'm going to like it here after all. Nana could hear the excitement in her granddaughter's voice. Well, honey, I sure miss having you around, she said, but I'm glad to know you're making new friends. After hanging up, Nana took out her favorite stationery. Wanting to share the good feeling, she wrote a letter to each of her grandchildren. Inside every envelope, she tucked a special sheet of animal stickers. Nana's youngest grandson was about to leave for the doctor's office when his letter arrived. All morning, he had been nervous about getting a shot, but after seeing the animal stickers, he forgot all about being afraid. In the doctor's waiting room, the boy sat next to a sad little girl with a cast on her arm. Here, he said, maybe my new animal stickers will help you feel better. The girl stopped crying and carefully placed the stickers on her cast. As the children giggled together, her father sighed with relief. His daughter had been upset for hours, and now she was happy again. After taking her home, the father rushed back to his busy auto shop. That night, a young man walked into the shop. Do you have any job openings, he asked. I work hard and I'm good at fixing cars. Still remembering the little boy's kindness in the doctor's office, the girl's father decided to give this stranger a chance. Well, he said, I could use some extra help. Let's give it a try. The grateful young man arrived early for work the next morning. His first job was completing the repairs on a dark green van. Just before noon, he returned the keys to a woman and her daughter. I'm glad I could help fix your van, he said. Thank you, said the little girl. Now we can go to my grandpa's birthday party after all. She smiled brightly at the man. It was a smile he remembered very well. A smile that had changed the world. And that's the end of our story today. This is the point where we normally sing the children out. I'm not sure there are any children to sing out this morning. <laughs> I don't think so. That's okay. We'll just keep going with our own music. Good morning again. Thank you for joining us today. As a member of the church choir, I can tell you uh, we always appreciate having an audience. Uh, I will also tell you that an empty room might not stop us from singing anyways. <laughs> Uh, I think I can say with confidence that this choir loves to sing together. Uh, music is our primary ministry to this church and to each other. It's also a lot of fun. Uh, if you like to sing, please join us on Thursday nights. We always have a good time. This week, we are singing one of our favorite pieces. It's rich in harmony and rhythm. It has a deep message. And most of us have been singing it long enough, we're unlikely to flub the words. Uh, Bill and I are both members of both the choir and the celebrant team, which helps to shape the Sunday services. Uh, we knew that Reverend Garman would be gone this weekend and that the choir would be singing this beloved anthem. So we had a little brainstorm. Today's service will include reflections from four of our choir members loosely surrounding the themes of the song which include gathering together, peace, and friendship. The lyrics are by Robert Gatznahos, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, taken in part from a poem by John Donne, one of my favorite poets, called, interestingly, Song. It's the name of the poem. Um, these are the lyrics. We are met together, and in meeting, we are blessed. Peace in coming and in going, peace in labor and in rest. Hold on, dear brother. Hold on, dear sister. Hold on to me. You're not alone and you never more will be. I will be with you and I will carry you with me. Friendship endures. And surely we will prove it's not ourselves but our bodies that move. Hold on to me. We hope you enjoy this song as much as we do. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
This week of Thanksgiving, we turn our hearts outward to ongoing world conflicts, not forgetting Ukraine. The hostages returned on Friday and yesterday in Gaza, not forgetting the people of Buffalo who have had to relive the horrors of last year's mass shooting as the gunman was sentenced this week. And remembering the lovely soul who was former First Lady Rosalind Carter, who dedicated her life to amplifying the challenge of mental illness and supporting caregivers. And of course, we look inward to the private joys, sorrows, and moments of reflection that the beginning of the holiday season brings to us all. Jim. A church is not a building, but a community. As a community of human hands and human hearts, we come together to share our laughter and our tears and to bear witness and to minister to one another as we struggle with life's sorrows and celebrate life's joys. Alma Hatfield was scheduled for knee surgery on November 22nd. And just before the service, I found out that she, it all went well and she is doing well. If you need contact information, please see me after the service. We now invite you to share the names of people you are holding in your hearts. You may speak them aloud or type them into the chat. May the light of our community shine on the broken places of the world. May the work of our hands and hearts support, aid, and comfort all those who hunger or thirst for food or water, justice or freedom. May we never look away when we are needed. May those who are grieving be comforted. May those who are tired find rest May the broken places be healed. May those who are filled with joy and laughter be abundant. We light three candles, one for the joys and sorrows shared aloud, one for those shared in writing, and one for those held silently among us. All of these we hold in our hearts let us be silent for a time.
institutions, ugh, in our in institutions, racism and other oppressions. This is the work of building a diverse, multicultural, beloved community. This is our journey towards spiritual wholeness. We cannot do this by ourselves. At the same time, no one else can do it for us. It requires individual responsibility and collective action, and it requires our individual and collective time, talent, and treasure. Let there then be an offering to support this work, to empower our resolve, to embody our love, to shine the beacon of justice. Contributions to the offering basket go towards First Unitarian Church's general operating budget, which funds our ongoing operations, ministry, programming, social justice work, and so much more. And don't forget the coffee. Contributions to our Faith in Action partners by members and friends may be made by scanning the QR code on the back of your order of service. This year's partners are Free Store, which helps provide household items to families recovering from domestic violence and other trauma, and the Iowa Trans Mutual Aid Fund, which financially supports trans, non-binary, and gender diverse Iowans as they access gender affirming care. Let there be an offering.
That was Bruce's request, okay? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> My name is Sarah Letourneau, she, her, hers. We are met together, and in meeting, we are blessed. For me, this song always evokes the Bible verse from Matthew, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. The key for me is not just the gathering or the meeting, but the in my name. In other words, the shared purpose. For where people meet with a shared purpose, there is a blessing, there is power. On a recent trip to Atlanta, I experienced two very different examples of this phenomenon. As a teenager, listening to burn CDs from my sister was how I first experienced The Marvelous Three, a rock band that had already broken up by the time I put them on in my disc man in 2003. Last month, my sister and I got to see them live in their hometown. The concert was at the Tabernacle Theater, which is an old church, which was a great appropriate sorry, an appropriate venue for a once in a lifetime show. Because whether or not you believe in a God, it's a truly spiritual experience to be among a couple thousand Gen Xers and millennials screaming at the top of their lungs along with lyrics they've known for 20 years. <laughs> There's a holiness in this to that shared purpose, even when the shared purpose is flipping the bird along with the lyrics. These experiences of shared purpose are ephemeral, but powerful. Earlier that day, I'd been moved by a different example of that power. When we went to the National Center for Civil and Human Rights and saw an exhibit about the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Across time and space, on footage I'd never seen before, there were 250,000 strong, powerful people in their Sunday best singing We Shall Overcome. The effect of those individuals marching with shared purpose is incalculable and continues to this day. That weekend in Atlanta brought into sharper focus for me what meeting with a shared purpose can mean and the dramatic impact coming together can have, whether it's the impact is on two sisters or on the world. Thank you. My name is Mary Hayes, and can you hear me? My name is Mary Hayes. Get that. My name is Mary Hayes. I want to read the first line from the lesson at small group ministry last week. Our lives are woven together, strands of thick and thin. The connections we make here are bonds woven of those threads. <clears throat> threads which sustain in times of need, <clears throat> and I add, in times of joy. Covenant means an agreement between and among people, unwritten, to work together toward common goals, health, success, peace, joy, and perhaps the resolution of disagreements or conflicts. The covenant is for a lifetime. And no, not only for us, but for those around us, other groups, other centers of worship. As I wrote this, I thought of congregations in Des Moines meeting this morning with a covenant to their members too, to other neighborhoods, to other countries, it is what we know or count on every day with the people who come our long away, along our way. People who come here to this community have a covenant. 
This last week, I was part of church services, two church services with coffee time and goodies. I came to a concert, two book groups. There was a woman's luncheon and a discussion group, handbells, of course, and choir. <laughs> what a joy. I participated, I was supported, and I was safe. Each time there are meetings or a hug or laughter or familiarity or safety, maybe a new learning, a new challenge, like an opportunity to clean the church on Saturday. <laughs> and sometimes disagreement. I have a biological family, sister, brother, and nieces and nephews. I have a covenant to rejoin, rejoice in their accomplishments and joys, but they don't live here. I don't see them often and they are busy. I have a covenant with the people I encounter here. I and you came without a ticket or a reservation this morning, trusting that there will be a greeting, a smile, comfort and maybe help, or even maybe the opportunity to speak to someone about misunderstood words. And hopefully I carry out my comfort covenant and my responsibility to listen, 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 to call you once in a while and speak well to you and of you wherever.
I occasionally think that Bruce is a wizard <laughs> because he always picks the perfect song. In that case, he picked one of my favorites of all time. In Meeting We Are Blessed was written by Troy Robertson in 2014 with text by Robert Gatznahos, further inspired by John Donne. It's quite a pedigree for a modern choral piece. I've loved it since we first sang it here at First Unitarian, and I always appreciate when Karen pulls it out for us to rehearse. We've performed it with an African djembe. Please, many thanks to Tyler today for his lovely performance. I'm sorry I didn't have your name to put in the order of service. <laughs> um, so the djembe provides percussion to move the song along, or sometimes we just have Bruce to keep us in tune. For this service, however, I, I dug a little deeper into the music. I've always just sort of liked it, but hadn't known much about it. Um, I discovered it was written for a remarkable meeting of the Festival Singers of Florida and the Nairobi Chamber Chorus, two community choirs. It was premiered in Nairobi, Kenya, with the composer Troy Robertson singing in the choir. You can find the YouTube of the performance. I strongly recommend it. It's beautiful. A music publisher noted on their website that in meeting we are blessed serves as a poignant reminder of the immense power and blessings that peace brings to individuals and communities alike. It exemplifies the enduring spirit of collaboration as different choirs from diverse corners of the world are inspired to come together sharing in the joy of music and the pursuit of harmony. That sounds very grand, and it can be when performed. Again, I really recommend finding all the performances of this piece on YouTube. Uh, they lift the spirit. It will be a rabbit hole you'll enjoy going down. For me, performing is a perfect example of music as worship and ministry. The choir spends some weeks learning and rehearsing the piece. We come early on a Sunday to warm our voices, then perform it for you, the congregation. We always hope you like it and that you won't notice our little flubs. We are met together and in meeting we are blessed. Peace in coming and in going, peace in labor and in rest. Our labor is in the singing, but for me, it says much about how we, as individuals, become one, hopefully, cohesive instrument. How we minister to you by sharing the resonance of our voices, the movement of our bodies, and the joy we feel in singing together. I cannot fathom worship or spiritual expression without the inclusion of shared music. For me, it's not church without singing. I know I'm not alone in that one. I've actually been to a church service where there was no music. I was like, what, what are we doing? It was like a lecture series. It was, it was a lecture series with an operatory. It was very strange. I ran across this article from The Advocate from early in COVID. I think it was like late 2020, early 21. The author, Jan Risher, was remembering how it felt in the before times to sing together. Singing in harmony, even when I'm singing the melody with other people, creates beauty. Growing up, I sang in a choir and with people multiple times every week. The experience of being a part of that beauty endures, even though I haven't sung with a choir for years. So during COVID, somebody asked me, what I missed most, <laughs> I didn't really stay home, I actually went to work, but you know, during COVID, what did I miss? I said, without hesitation, hugging my mom and singing in choirs, that's it. That's all I missed. Everything else was replaceable, at least in the short term. You're not alone and you never more will be. I will be with you and I will carry you with me. That describes a choir, if nothing else does. 
Jan Rischer also shared that her best friend Kathy lists In Meeting We Are Blessed as her favorite song, and she introduced Jan to it. <laughs> Jan writes, my children are embarrassed for me at the number of times I've watched videos of choirs singing that song. I am not. The song is about the power of being together, something so many of us long for, but it's also about the power of staying connected when our bodies move and we are apart. The mere mortals among us may not be able to sing in harmony or unison as we once did for months to come. Even so, friendships can endure. Hold on to me. Psychology today defines loneliness as the state of distress or discomfort that results when one perceives a gap between one's desires for social connections and actual experiences of it. The first humans no doubt felt the immense stress of being alone when facing the fear of attack from an animal or another human or a weather-related calamity. I'm certain they took comfort in the company of trusted others. We learned early on that indeed there is safety in numbers. In our present world, where division seems to be the rule and not the exception, where we sometimes wonder if we should even speak to a stranger for fear of what they might say or do, where it feels as if loneliness is spread through the aerosols we breathe, there is great comfort in finding a place to go where everybody knows your name. And indeed, they're always glad you came. And for you younger folks, you can stream an episode of the 80s TV show Cheers to find out the reference. <laughs> I have several places in my life where I experience the grace of safety. At home with Karen and Rachel is my place of peace. I know that I am always safe and loved there. I know they will carry me with them through all their days, and I will carry them with me through all my days. I know I am lucky, as too many people find home to be unsafe. This Friday, I gathered with a group of guys at which I became a part nearly 50 years ago. Back in the mid-70s, my college roommates invited me to take part in their annual day after Thanksgiving turkey bowl game, football. The guys playing all graduated from the same Catholic high school in my hometown in 1974. I, on the other hand, graduated from a public high school in the same Wisconsin town one year later. They started their game in 74. I jumped in three years later. Those early games were rough. Tackle football, no helmets, no pads. 10 or 11 guys aside repeatedly running into each other can be scary sometimes. One year, a player suffered a broken leg. They helped him into the back of a station wagon, propped his leg up on a beer case, and drove him to the emergency room. <laughs> In 1986, the first year Karen, uh, Karen joined my family for Thanksgiving, I knocked heads with a big guy that resulted in a black dot in my line of vision for several days. She drove us back to Iowa. <laughs> in later years, we turned to flag football, then to bowling. <laughs> it's Wisconsin, it's, what you, it's always the fallback, bowling. And now simply going out for beers and lunch. And my connection to these guys runs deep. One of them became one of my very best friends and was the best man at our wedding. We call each other regularly. Another was my roommate for five years. I've been in the same NFL football pool with three of those guys since 1977, still betting a dollar a week on who will have the most correct picks. No adjustment for inflation. <laughs> this is our 47th straight year getting hold of each other every week from September to February to share picks and friendly banter. Two of them have accompanied me to the college hockey finals every year since 1993. These guys are a treasure to me. We will always be there for each other. 
I feel the same way when I gather with my Democratic Party friends twice monthly to share our common commitment to justice and freedom. And there's our church. This is my true religious home. I rejected my parents' Christian fundamentalism in my teens. And after 25 plus years in a mainline Christian church as an adult, I found that while I like the people there and their commitment to social justice, I could no longer go along with the liturgy and be true to myself. The words I recited every week became rote. And while there is comfort and consistency in reciting words that go back centuries, it got to the point where I didn't any longer believe what I, what I was saying. At First Unitarian, it was so clear early on that what I believed was up to me and that there were opportunities here to explore that further. There is great comfort in coming to a place where you can truly be yourself and not be judged for what you believe. And I found kinship in the choir and with folks with whom I served on the board and committees. Maintaining these relationships at home, with friends, with colleagues, and with fellow church members is like caring for a garden to flourish. It takes being attentive to others and frequent tending. May we all flourish in our relationships with others. May it be so. For our closing hymn, please rise as you are willing and able to sing number 108, My Life Flows On in Endless Song. Please say with me our unison, chalice, extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame as we cannot leave it untended, but we carry it with us in the days to come. It's a reminder that here we are never alone and that as we move, we move together. We have met together, and in meeting, we have been blessed. Peace be with us in our going, in our labor, and our rest. Peace be with us all, until we meet again. Amen.